Section 31, Chapter 17 of The Life and Adventures of Kit Carson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. The Life and Adventures of Kit Carson by DeWitt C. Peters. Section 31, Chapter 17, Part 3. The word village has many times appeared in our pages and as it may prove ambiguous to a few of our readers and render them liable to confound its meaning with that of a fixed town we will here stop and explain its signification when applied to indians an indian village as understood in border parlance comprises the lodges the women children old men and such movable property as indians may chance to possess they are usually found in some safe retreat where the old men women and children stay while the warriors are engaged following the hunt or warpath the word has become more generalized since it was first given to stationary camps of the savages and may now include any band of indians traveling with their families and property the village is the home of the red man where those persons and things which he most cherishes he tries to keep intact and sacred from the spoiler's hand it is also where the indian allows his love friendship and all the better feelings of his nature to exhibit themselves it is where in early youth he has listened to the legends of his tribe and where he is taught those lessons and forced to endure those trials which are to prepare his heart in seeking out revenge it is the place where as he approaches the age of manhood he takes those steps which are to make for him the reputation of a daring hunter and brave warrior here he first learns to shoot his arrows with precision and to handle the lance with dexterity his boyish feats in horsemanship which he daily performs in the village would be witnessed with astonishment by skilful riders it is here that he runs to welcome his father when he returns either from the chase or the warpath and while he listens to the marvellous adventures which his sire has encountered he secretly wishes himself a man so that he can emulate his greatness in fact the same feelings exist between parent and child with the indian race as with those who boast of being more civilized youth and the vigor of manhood are the golden days with the savage to be doomed to old age is considered by him to be a punishment when he is no longer able to hunt and seek out his enemy he loses his desire to live his life is then considered an encumbrance to the camp the old and infirm therefore are often willingly deserted that they may the more quickly die the village is always under the surveillance of men who are past the middle age and who no longer can act out the stirring deeds of the warrior their experience renders them capable of giving good advice and attending to the less active affairs of the nation they hold the power of restraining the rashness and indiscretion of the younger men therefore they are selected to watch over the property of the tribe while the strong warriors are seeking to provide the dependent portion of the band with food or to revenge their real or imaginary wrongs order and good fellowship is made to prevail in these villages somewhat similar to the habits found in civilized communities for the passions and evil propensities of all men are found to be alike no matter what differences of education or color exist we find that the indian tribes have their wise men whose voices are heard and heeded on all occasions. When these villages are located, or, to use the soldier phrase, when the Indians go into camp, care is taken that each lodge shall be placed where it will not interfere with the common good. The internal economy of these habitations is arranged on a social system which, in many respects, is commendable. When one person is poor, generally speaking, the whole tribe is found to be so, the herds of horses and mules belonging to the tribe are turned loose in one body as if they were the property of one man if game exists in plenty and danger is not apprehended happiness holds complete sway within these indian homes the proverbial caution of the red man rarely allows him to be surprised therefore even in times of peace he keeps his fleetest horse tied at the door of his lodge so that he may make haste and collect his property and be away before his enemy can harm him these favored animals are fed by hand before trusting his body in sleep some warrior 
in whom the tribe reposed the utmost confidence must ascend a neighboring eminence if there chanced to be one and examine the country in search of dangers parties are always kept out as spies and at the least appearance of suspicious signs they become easily aroused and vigilant and if danger really exists word is immediately sent to their village to be ready to move this is a homely but literal interpretation of the term indian village the reader has seen that the dragoon horses gave out before the fatigues of the march while the mexican ponies performed their task so admirably and easily this was a painful subject to contemplate and one which no man who loves the noble horse could wish to witness the second time the dragoon horses reduced to skeletons from starvation while retaining all their natural spirit with tottering limbs faithfully tried to perform the labor which their riders seemingly asked of them long before the arrival of the time when they could no longer support a burden the soldiers had humanely relieved them from this work and were assisting them by all the means in their power to reach a haven of safety where food so essential in restoring their sinking powers of life existed in abundance as their little remaining strength was leaving them they would exhibit the fact by staggering finally breaking down in their hinder legs they would sink to the ground but not until they had made the effort to drag themselves along with their forefeet to relieve them from their agonies and prevent their falling into the hands of the indians one by one they were shot when these horses broke down and began to die off it was decided to be best to return to fort massachusetts in order to recruit and also to allow the indians an opportunity to concentrate their forces when another effective blow could be struck against them on his return colonel fauntleroy met at the designated place lieutenant beale who had managed the affairs entrusted to him very much to his credit having once more consolidated his command colonel fauntleroy retired to fort massachusetts which he made for a time his headquarters kit carson the guide of this expedition when afterwards speaking of it says during the time our forces were in the field they were exposed to the utmost intense cold weather i ever remember experiencing we were overtaken by several severe snowstorms which came near completely using us up for the success that had so far attended the labors of this body of soldiers the greatest amount of praise is due to their leader who set a noble example to his men during those hours when hardships and trials came thickest upon the command all eyes were turned to the commander and as the result proved with no lack of confidence kit carson's services were found to be invaluable his long experience and untiring energy proved to be one of the best anchors of the goodly ship we should not omit to state in regard to the severity of the cold that it was early in the morning just before the break of day that the cold was invariably found to be the most intense during this time it is the greatest wonder that the mexicans did not perish for but few of them had more than one blanket as a covering by night and the remainder were but very little better provided for when wood was plenty and they were allowed to do so they made large fires and laid down near to them to attempt sleep after about one hour thus spent they were routed out by being nearly frozen getting into close contact with the fires they would thaw out and then were ready to make another endeavor to repeat the sleeping operation in this manner they managed to live through each night and on the following day they were apparently none the worse for wear a person judging these men as he oftentimes sees them during the summer season basking in the sunlight on the sunny side of their houses in new mexico would not for an instant suppose that they could undergo such hardships and yet they can do so as the above example sufficiently proves without allowing one murmur of complaint to escape their lips with the regulars who were amply supplied with blankets and buffalo robes it would appear that they could have obtained sound sleep but this too proved to be almost an impossibility the heat of the man's body during the early and warmer part of the night served to melt the icy covering of the mother earth just under him when the cold increased this was again frozen rendering the portion of the body nearest to the ground almost benumbed by frequently reversing the posture a little some relief from suffering was obtained but not sufficient to reach a degree which could be called comfortable or in the least be claimed as desirable 
Every member of this expedition can truthfully assert that they have experienced a foretaste of what the first symptoms of freezing to death must be. Finally, the command reached Fort Massachusetts, where, in ease and plenty, the half-starved, half-frozen, half-used-up men soon forgot all their troubles and privations. A few weeks spent at the fort acted like a magic charm in recruiting the men and the remaining animals when they were once more in a fit condition, and again eager to go on the warpath, anxiously desiring to surpass the splendid deeds of their first tramp. At the permanent camp, which was made near Fort Massachusetts, the Mexican volunteers especially enjoyed themselves hugely. From privations of various kinds to which they had shown themselves to be well trained, and which consequently affected them but little, they were suddenly placed in a state of comparative comfort and even luxury rarely realized at their own homes. They had not much else to do beyond guarding their animals and attending to such other minor duties as were required by camp duties. Had not their hardy ponies required the rest that was now being given them, these troops would have been kept in more active service, but as this could not be, they were allowed a respite, which they themselves turned into pleasure. Foot races and various athletic games were concocted and played by them, making the time pass merrily by. Their discipline and respect for their officers had reached a degree seldom, if ever, attained by volunteer soldiers, and which, in many respects, could be imitated with advantage by regular troops. But the time soon arrived for the march to be resumed. At a council held among the chief officers, it was decided that the best and surest course to be followed would be to divide the forces and send them out in quest of the Indians, as if they were separate commands. Thus it might happen that being caught between the two, as they were running from danger, they would rush into it and receive chastisement, sufficient to answer all purposes. Acting on this plan, Colonel St. Vrain, with most of the volunteers, was ordered to proceed in one direction, while Colonel Fauntleroy, with the main division, started in another, while on his route, Colonel Fauntleroy traveled close in under the mountains, and kept his men as much concealed as possible, making most of his marches by night. He traveled through the valley of San Luis up to its head. The valley of San Luis is about one hundred miles in length. Its greatest width is fifty miles. On either side it is bounded by snow-capped mountains. The scenery of the valley is very prepossessing, being sure to enchant the eye throughout its entire length. In the south the valley is continuous with prairie land, which extends down as far as the settlement of Rio Colorado. It is well watered by mountain streams and bears the appearance of being an excellent farming district, but the probability is that its climate is too cold for raising crops, and that its true value will be found chiefly to consist in using it for grazing purposes. From time to time the Indians have reported that it contains gold mines, but there are no authentic proofs that this is a fact. At one time the Indians succeeded in making the Mexicans converts to the belief in the existence of these mines, as they showed them specimens of gold, which they affirmed to have been taken from them. It was agreed that, for this valuable information, presents, such as blankets, horses, and guns, should be made to those Indians who had openly proclaimed the good news, provided they could conduct the Mexicans to them. A party was formed and started to explore the valley, but as nothing was afterwards heard of their success, and as many of them, to all external appearances, were as poor as ever when they returned, it is presumed that they were duped by the Indians. The bottom land of the Rio Grande, which skirts the southern border of the valley of San Luis, is, judging from the luxuriant hay crops which it produces year by year, quite a good farming section and, no doubt, ere long, the Mexicans will there establish a new settlement, and thus practically demonstrate the use to which this beautiful valley can be put. While passing up the valley of San Luis, Colonel Fauntleroy came to the Punchi Pass. This pass is the main opening through the mountains which bounds the valley of San Luis on the north. The pass itself is less than half a mile wide, but yet it presents some of the grandest scenery human eyes ever beheld. The mountains on either side are not so lofty as their compeers close by, but they are rugged and picturesque. Through the pass runs a bold stream, which at about midway, and at this time, 
was obstructed by a beaver dam that was so scientifically constructed as immediately to attract the attention of the entire party near to this dam there is a very large hot spring which is located close under the base of one of the mountain sides and which under the favorable circumstance of a fine day lends enchantment to the view the punchi pass is but a few miles long and leads into a beautiful little valley called by the mexicans after the same name which is given to the pass on arriving at the punchi pass colonel fauntleroy proceeded on through it to the headwaters of the arkansas river where fortunately a fresh trail made by the indians was found this trail was followed with such assiduity and prudence that the camp of some spies belonging to the enemy and which was in their rear was passed by the americans one night without their presence being noticed early the ensuing morning before the break of day the main village of the indians was discovered its occupants were enjoying a war and scalp dance and their voices as engaged in the song which usually accompanies such festivities could be heard for a distance of at least a mile unconscious of danger they were having a merry time one can imagine better than can be described the scene that followed when three hundred loaded rifles poured their contents into this crowd suffice it to say that among those who survived this terrible retribution the greatest consternation prevailed but as a dernier resort they began to fly when they were hotly pursued by the soldiers before quitting their late camp some of the savages had managed to get their own rifles and with them to fire several shots which did some execution as two soldiers were killed and two wounded thus it will be seen that the main village of these apaches and utahs fell into the hands of the americans it proved to be rich in plunder for it contained all their stock of dried buffalo meat besides other provisions also several cartloads of robes saddles weapons ropes skins blankets trinkets and camp equipage most of this property was collected and destroyed by fire being of little use to the command whose means of conveyance was limited to their own actual wants the number of indians killed in this surprise has been variously estimated as has been also the number of the red men on the ground when the carnage commenced but all agree that this was the severest blow these savages had ever received among the many other objects of curiosity found by the victors was a medicine lodge which had from appearance but recently been in full blast it was highly and to indian eyes it must have been very artistically decorated and contained all the emblems and symbols of witchcraft if sickness was to be frightened away or even coaxed to dethrone itself from the afflicted there was sufficient in this temple of the indian gods seemingly to have answered either purpose some potentate of the magnitude of a great chief had evidently but a few hours since been its occupant for in his hurry to desert the premises on hearing the music of the white man's rifle he had forgotten his beautiful headdress of feathers and other articles pertaining to his wardrobe which designated to the captors his high rank perhaps and the surmise may not be far out of the way this chief was suffering from a gunshot wound inflicted on a recent fight by his pale-faced enemy and having received one of their most dangerous potions of lead he was not anxious for another and therefore made his escape with the activity of a well man in this expedition a company of artillery who have before been described doing duty as infantry performed a feat that will compare well with anything of the same kind on record these men under the command of lieutenant bell who shared all the privations of his soldiers marched on foot through a mixture of mud and snow nearly ankle deep over an uneven country from the moscow pass in the valley of san louis to the headwaters of the arkansas river a distance which is computed at eighty-five miles in thirty-six hours including all their stoppages this company had been long celebrated as being expert marksmen therefore their services were much needed when the indian village was discovered although nearly broken down with fatigue yet as soon as the electrifying news of the enemy being so near at hand reached them it seemed to inspire them with new vigor they dashed ahead and gallantly led the van in this assault which terminated so favorably to the side of the americans 
Colonel Fauntleroy was not satisfied with the victory already obtained, but, after having accomplished all that was possible for him in this quarter, and having scattered the Indians to the four winds, he determined to make forced marches in order to surprise another band of them, who were supposed to be located in a distant mountain haunt, well known to his guide. His object in thus hurrying away from the scenes of his late triumph was to reach and surprise the Indians before their friends had time to travel to and apprise them of their defeat. In this maneuver he was also successful. He came upon this second band also before they were aware of their danger. They were routed, and after severe loss were followed far into the mountains. At this camp, Blanco, the celebrated Apache chief, was driven to such close quarters that he evidently began to feel that the safety of his whole tribe stood in jeopardy. He made his appearance on a high point of rocks, and asked the white man who occupied the plain beneath for a parley, which was granted him. He said, in the Spanish language, that he and his Indians wished to make peace, that they were tired of fighting. In reply, he was informed that the terms he demanded would be listened to on his coming into the soldier's camp. He was going on to say that he was afraid to trust himself there, when a bullet was sent whizzing by his head, which caused him to decamp in all haste. It was ascertained afterwards that a Mexican, who had great antipathy to this chief, had, unknown to the rest of the party, crept secretly up into the rocks. When he had reached a place where Blanco was within the range of his rifle, he fired, but, as the reader has inferred, he missed an accurate aim. At this latter camp or village, and near the close of this same day, another incident happened which will long be remembered by those who witnessed it. Two Indians, who probably had been absent to some distant section of the country, having no knowledge of the matters which had lately been transpiring, were seen approaching. Gradually they grew near to a cottonwood grove of trees in which the soldiers were resting, thinking, no doubt, that they were there about to meet their friends. A mountaineer by the name of Stuart, who commanded the spy company, and another man, one of the Mexican volunteers, immediately on seeing the Indians, sprang upon the backs of their horses, which chanced to be nearby, and started out to attack them. Not until these Indians saw the men advancing were they made aware of their danger, when instantly they turned around their animals and put them on a keen run for the nearest mountain. They were pursued, and the race hotly contested for at least two miles but the Indians succeeded in making their escape, although shots were fired at them and returned by the Indians. In doing so, one of them was obliged to dismount and leave his horse behind him, which fell into the hands of his pursuers. At the time that the chief Blanco was endeavoring to gain a parley, a stirring scene was being enacted at the soldier's camp, which was several miles distant. Most of the soldiers had left it and were then out engaged in the business of scouring the country. In the camp there were all the pack animals, provisions, luggage, etc., of the command. To guard this property there were only about fifty men left, who, anticipating no danger, were employing themselves in cooking and otherwise providing for the wants of their absent friends against their return. The herd of mules was scattered about and grazing under the charge of a few herders. Suddenly a band of about one hundred warriors were discovered coming down the little valley where the camp was located. The alarm was given when each man, seizing his rifle, rushed to place himself in the line of sentinels which were forming around the property. The mules were quickly driven together in a compact body into the center of the camp. Hardly had this movement been performed before the red men came galloping by. Seeing the smallness of the force opposed to them, they made two or three attempts at an attack on the weakest points of the lines. They were about to succeed when a shout went up from the Americans who described relief in the shape of the foot company which having been left behind for one night in order to make easy marches and thus partially rest themselves was now approaching the indians saw the near approach of this powerful reinforcement and using that discretion which is often the better part of valor they started off and were soon lost sight of had not this reinforcement providentially thus arrived the indians would have certainly captured the pack mules belonging to the soldiers, and got away with them. Never was succor hailed with more delight than on this occasion, for had the red men succeeded in this endeavor, 
the benefits of this whole campaign would have been greatly frustrated colonel fauntleroy after thoroughly scouring the adjacent country in the hope of meeting with parties of straggling indians but as the result proved without success returned to fort massachusetts where he had the satisfaction of learning that colonel st brain in his expedition had caught other bands of these same indians and most severely chastised them the fort massachusetts here referred to has recently been abandoned and another one has been built distant about six miles from the original site the name is retained for the new defences which are located on the river trinchera the present location is picturesque and beautiful in the extreme in one of his fights colonel st vrain had overtaken the red men on the prairies where a running battle ensued in which the volunteers killed many of the enemy and made several prisoners during this skirmish the indians tried the ruse of setting fire to the prairie grass and as the wind was blowing in the direction from which their foes were coming they hoped thereby to impede their progress and thus give themselves time to escape but the volunteers boldly rode through the flames and successfully continued the chase the time for which the new mexican volunteers had enlisted was fast drawing to a close but as the hostile utahs and apaches were scattered to the four winds it was thought best not to send out again a regularly appointed force to act against them instead while awaiting the effect of their late telling blows it was decided to be judicious to keep out in different directions small scouting parties who could better follow the trails of the small parties of fugitive indians with some prospect of success it was now the season for the richly laden caravans to arrive on the borders of the territory and perchance they might fall in with the bands of the hostile savages of sufficient strength to cause them trouble or it might be the indians would combine in sufficient strength being driven by pressing want to capture some one of these trains and thus obtain the material for renewing the contest in view of these apprehensions it was decided that the regular troops should go out on the plains where they could be on hand ready to afford protection in case of need major blake in command of the dragoons started out and faithfully performed this mission after this duty was fully accomplished he visited the mountains to the northeast of fort massachusetts and then returned to taos via the fort and the intervening mexican towns while intimating the dangers which may befall trains on their journey across the plains especially in times of indian war it may be well to narrate a fatal adventure which once happened to a small party while travelling this route not many miles from fort union and on the plains there was a clump of hills known as the wagon mound so called from their resemblance to one of those peculiar wagons which are used to transport valuable freight across the country it being dangerous times a party of ten picked men had been sent out to ensure the safe transit of the mail everything went well with the little band of travellers and their prospects were becoming bright for making a safe journey when suddenly a large band of hostile apaches and utahs hove in sight the mail party on making this discovery immediately halted and prepared for a fight the indians very soon granted to them this favor at first the attack was sharply maintained but at last fortune favored the whites for the time being and they succeeded in repulsing their foes who retreated out of sight the mail party thus being freed from the unpleasant society of the indians at once hitched up their teams and proceeded on their route it was afterwards learned that the apaches made the first attack but they were countenanced by the utahs who remained close by on the return of the unsuccessful war party of the apaches to the utahs the latter at once commenced charging them with cowardice and boasted that they could have done better the true state of the case was that the utahs were using the apaches as tools by which to gain plunder crying go dog while they themselves were keeping out of harm's way the anger of the apaches was fully aroused at these derisive imputations under the new impulse they said to the utahs if you will help we will return and show you whether we are afraid to meet these pale faces another attack having been decided upon the indians set out and overtook the male party once more near to this wagon mound it was snowing fast at the time 
Therefore the white men were comfortably traveling in their vehicles and had their guns protected with suitable coverings to prevent their being injured, for they anticipated no further danger. The curtains of the mail wagons were all fastened down, and there was no lookout kept, for it was considered sufficient to prepare for the furies of the storm. The Indians accordingly approached unperceived, and made such a desperate attack that all the white men were quickly killed. Not one, if the boasts of the Indians can be believed, had time to get out from his seat. Several days elapsed, and no tidings were heard of the expected mail party. Therefore, a body of men started out in quest of the missing men, and found them sleeping the last sleep which knows no awakening. The bodies of the dead were decently interred, and since that day the wagon mound is pointed out to the traveler accompanied with an historical account of this awful tragedy. End of section 31, chapter 17, part 3. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Section 32, Chapter 17, Part 4 of The Life and Adventures of Kit Carson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty on the Central Coast of California. The Life and Adventures of Kit Carson by DeWitt C. Peters. Section 32, Chapter 17, Part 4. During the campaign under consideration, several Indian children were captured. These were generally under the age of ten years. They could not stand the kindly planned treatment which they received while in bondage. For many of them died from overeating, after having so long been accustomed to Indian frugality. One of the women prisoners taken, openly declared, and there is no reason why she should not be believed, that many of the younger children belonging to her tribe had been strangled by their parents and friends in order to prevent their becoming an inconvenience, and thus prevent their being able to prosecute the war, thereby showing that their hatred of the white man was deeply rooted and that their anger had been aroused to its highest degree. On the publishing of peace, those Indian children who still lived were collected and through the Indian agents restored to their relatives and friends. The good effect which the moral of this campaign had on the surrounding Indian nations cannot be denied. They soon became loud in proclaiming their friendships for the Americans. Taking advantage of the now crippled condition of the Utahs and Apaches, their enemies, the Arapahoes and Cheyennes, were ready to pounce upon them at a moment's warning. The opportunity did not, however, present itself until long after peace had been established with the white men, when the Utahs and the Apaches had been able to recover from their losses and collect again. War party after war party of Cheyennes and Arapahoes entered the country of their old enemies the Apaches and Utahs, but returned unable to find them. Yellow Bear, a head war chief of the Arapahoes, did not accompany his braves on these expeditions, and he would not believe that they could not find either the Apaches or Utahs. Therefore, to show his people that there was one warrior living of the olden stamp, he started, accompanied by his youngest squaw, to meet and fight them. A severe snowstorm compelled this noble chieftain to come into Fort Massachusetts. While he was there, the commanding officer of the post endeavored to dissuade him from his rash undertaking. In reply, the chief said, Captain, my young men are no longer warriors. They have become squaws. I sent them to seek out our nation's enemies. They went, discovered their fires, and counted their lodges, but were afraid to attack them. I am now on my way to find the Utah village where I intend either to smoke the pipe of peace or offer fight to any three of their chiefs. If they kill me otherwise than fairly, perhaps it will stir up once more the fire in the breasts of the warriors of the Arapaho Nation. 
The speech was delivered with so much pathos, and yet with such an oratorical air that the interpreter was enabled to catch and translate every word of it. Yellow Bear was now informed of the recent campaign against the Utahs and Apaches, but the news made no change in his determination. The advice was words thrown away, as he was found conversant with the whole proceedings of the campaign. We have brought in this incident to show how surrounding tribes are directly affected and personally interested in the results of all military transactions with hostile Indians. As we have taken up for a theme the story of this brave and really noble Indian, it may prove interesting to some of our readers if we complete the picture. Yellow Bear has always been the firm friend of Kit Carson, both by word and action. He is the finest specimen of an Indian that the writer ever laid eyes on. He stands in his moccasins over six feet, is straight and symmetrically proportioned. The head, however, is the main attraction of this Indian. Never was a statesman possessed of a better. We once heard him address a large council of his warriors, and although we could not understand one word he said, yet our attention was fixed on the man for we never saw either before or since such majestic gestures mixed with equal grace in any speaker. It was a masterpiece of acting, and from the humphs or grunts ejaculated by his auditors, we were inclined to think that the speech was impressive. There was one great point about this chief which those who are familiar with the Indian race, as they now exist, cannot but admire. He has never been known to beg. Rather than do this, we believe he would actually starve. We will finish this description of Yellow Bear by adding that he finally listened to the advice of the then commanding officer of Fort Massachusetts and returned to his own nation. On the final arrival at Taos of the troops engaged in this brilliant Indian campaign against the Utahs and Apaches, they received orders to disband. Those whose calling was arms returned to their respective military posts, while the New Mexicans scattered to seek their homes, where they were received and justly treated as heroes. Before the forces were dispersed, the Pueblo Indians, who had been employed in the spy companies, gave with the aid of their friends by moonlight a grand war-dance entertainment in the plaza of the town. It proved to be a fine display of this time-honored Indian custom. The combined efforts of the two commanders, Colonel Fauntleroy and Lieutenant Colonel St. Vrain, aided by their followers, among whom Kit Carson played a most conspicuous and important part, had the effect to compel the Indians to send a delegate to Santa Fe, commissioned to sue for peace. Peace was finally granted, which formed a most happy and pleasing termination to this brilliant Indian campaign. It proved afterwards that a great mistake was made in hastily allowing these Indians to evade the punishment they so richly deserved, and which was being so summarily inflicted by entertaining so soon conciliatory measures. At the council that was subsequently held, it was found that only a part of the Apaches were present to sanction the proceedings, and that the remainder were still in the mountains and were either hostile or undecided what course they would pursue. Kit Carson, their agent, was at that meeting, and earnestly opposed the policy of making a treaty so long as any portion of the two nations were insubordinate, as it offered a loophole for those present to creep out whenever they were so inclined. He said, That now is the time, if ever, when they might, at a small additional expense, and, with the prospect of saving many valuable lives, show these Indians that they were dealing with a powerful government. His voice and experience were overruled by the other officials present, and the treaty was made. It stipulated that the Indians should receive certain sums annually in case they would settle down and commence farming, and that they should be allowed to select their own locality within certain prescribed limits. The making of such offers to tribes of savages half-subdued is absurd. The wisdom of this assertion has since been clearly shown, for hardly one article contained in the treaty there made has been carried out. 
the actions of those apaches present at the council were trifling in the extreme notwithstanding which they were presented with some cattle these they objected to receiving on the ground that they were not fat enough to suit their fastidious tastes they insolently addressed the government officials with the following strain if you do not give us better we will again take the road where we can have our choice the fact was that these half-starved rascals saw that the white men were anxious to make peace and hence they assumed a haughty air in order to drive a good bargain the great results which should have been brought about by the teachings of colonels fauntleroy and st verain by this weak diplomacy were more or less frustrated these gentlemen however had won great renown they had the savages driven to such extremes that one more expedition led by them in person would have subdued all their obstinacy and made them over anxious for peace the indians had been seven times caught and on every one of the occasions they had been greatly worsted they had lost at least five hundred horses all their camp equipage ammunition provisions and most of their arms and were indeed almost at the mercy of the whites under these circumstances they should have been shown true magnanimity and greatness by forcing them into that course which was and is for their own welfare as well as the welfare of the country and against which they themselves so blindly contend say to an indian that ere many years have passed by the buffalo will all be destroyed and he will answer you that the great spirit rains them down in the mountains for his red children this is a fair example of the manner in which most of them listen to the voice of reason it requires practical and active demonstrations by means of rifles and other weapons to teach them they will not be permitted to plunder and murder at pleasure the wrong of this conduct they are as well aware of as their white brethren it is by rifle arguments that their treaties become worth the value of the paper upon which they are written it is a well-known fact that people who live in indian countries prefer to have the red men at war rather than bound to peace by such slender ties as they are usually called upon to take upon themselves in the former case the settler knows what to expect and is always prepared for the worst so far as it lies in his power but in the latter position he is continually exposed to the caprices of a race who are in many respects as changeable as the very air they breathe in the old mexican town of don fernandez de taos as we have said before resides at the present time kit carson a stranger entering this town and especially at a little distance from it is reminded of a number of brick kilns just previous to being burnt and all huddled together without any regard being paid to symmetry in order to reach the plaza which is the main feature of the attraction belonging to the town the traveler is obliged to follow the crooks and turns of several unattractive streets the home of kit carson faces on the west side of this public square it is a building only one story in height but as it extends over considerable space of ground it makes up in part this deficit and within it is surpassed by but few other houses in the country for the degree of comfort which it furnishes to its occupants on most any fair day around the doors of this house may be seen many indians of various tribes who are either waiting for their companions within or else the opportunity to present itself so that they themselves can enter business or no business to transact with kit carson they cannot come to town without visiting father kit and having a smoke and talk with him kit carson enjoys himself in their society for his heart and hand have long since taught them that irrespective of the office which he holds towards them he is their true friend and benefactor never is his patience exhausted by their lengthy visits he listens to their narrations of grievances which they lay freely before him for his counsel, even in matters exclusively personal. Being familiar with all those things which will, in the least, touch their feelings and make them interested, he finds no difficulty in entering into the spirit of their affairs in a manner that exactly suits their tastes. 
This causes them to look upon him in the same light as they would upon some brave and experienced chief of their own race. Kit Carson takes every opportunity to warn the Indians against the use of intoxicating drinks, and shows them by his own example that fire water is a dangerous luxury which man does not require and in which he should not indulge. Notwithstanding his best efforts, now and then they get under its influence. On becoming sober, they are so ashamed of their conduct that they often keep clear of their agent until they think he has forgotten the occurrence. Kit Carson, to a certain extent, treats Indians as a wise father does his own children. Hence, he has won their respect as well as confidence, which fact has given him more influence over them than any other man in the country where he lives. When Kit Carson enters the various villages of the Indians under his supervision, he is invariably received with the most marked attention. Having selected the warrior whose guest he intends to be, he accompanies him to his lodge, which is known during his stay as the Soldier's Lodge. He gives himself no concern about his horse, saddle, bridle rifle, or any minor thing. The brave whom he has thus honored considers that he has assumed the responsibility of a soldier and so styles himself. This making of a soldier is no everyday business with the Indians. It is only when they are visited by some great personage for whom they have the greatest respect that this ceremony is gone through with. When thus favored, the soldier at once becomes the sworn friend of the white man who occupies his lodge and will fight and die for him even against his own brethren. It is the opinion of Kit Carson that Indians should not be allowed to come when it pleases them into the settlements. Every visit which they thus make is detrimental to them in many ways. He thinks that the time thus spent could be better employed in hunting or otherwise providing for the wants of their families. In the towns of the frontiers they do nothing but beg and learn the vices of the white man, which, added to their own, make them as dangerous and wicked as men can be. In lieu thereof, he advises that mission and agency houses should be established in their midst, when supplies should be furnished to them in a time of need. As matters now stand, the Indians, during a severe winter, or from some unforeseen accident, are liable to become suddenly destitute. They are then compelled either to starve, or to make inroads upon the property of the settlers on the frontiers. Besides his Indian friends, Kit Carson is surrounded by a host of Mexicans and Americans, to whom he has greatly endeared himself. To his children, Kit Carson is a kind and indulgent father, and to best illustrate his self-sacrificing attachment for them, it is only necessary to relate one striking incident of its proof. A few years since he was returning to Taos from Rayado, whither he had been on a visit in company with his wife, two children, and two servants, a Mexican man and woman. The party had completed the first half of their journey and were jogging over a tract of prairie land that was of considerable extent, when suddenly Kit Carson discovered, far off, a band of about forty Indians. Being so exposed, he at once concluded that he had also been seen, for while he was looking, he thought he could see the speed of their riding animals increase. The glaring rays of the sun impeded his view so that he could not discern at such distance, either from their dress or appearance, to what tribe they belonged. He was in a section of country that was frequently visited by the marauding Comanches, and as their signs had been recently seen in the neighborhood, he made up his mind that it was a band of this tribe that he now saw. No time was to be lost, so dismounting from the very fleet horse he was riding, he placed in his saddle his wife and eldest child. To the first named he gave directions. To follow on the trail that led to Taos, and let the bridle reins be a little slack so that the horse would know what was expected of him when he would travel at the top of his speed. He said that he intended to ride towards the Indians and engage them at first in a parley and then, if necessary, offer them a single-handed combat. At any rate, before they could manage to kill him, she would have sufficient time to lessen her danger. 
As to the remainder of the party, he added, there was no alternative but for them to take their chances for life or death. Bidding his wife and boy goodbye, with one heart-rendering look, he turned to face his apparent doom. As Kit approached the Indians, they began to call out his name. As soon as he heard this, he aroused himself from the agonizing frame of mind he had been laboring under after parting with all that was so dear to him, and as he had thought, for the last time. To his joy, Kit quickly recognized before him the familiar faces of some of his Indian friends. They had come, as they afterwards informed him, to see him and his helpless charge safely lodged in their home, for they had become aware that he was exposed to great danger. While the friends were talking, some of the Indians began to laugh, which caused Carson to turn his head and look in the direction they were gazing. To his astonishment and disgust, he saw, the truth was too evident to be mistaken, that the cowardly Mexican man had, on his leaving, pulled off from her horse Mrs. Carson and her child, and having mounted the animal himself, was making good his escape. The Indians wished to keep up the ruse, pursue, attempt to overtake and punish the poltroon, but Kit Carson was too thankful that matters had gone so well. Therefore he said that he felt he could excuse such a dastardly conduct, and requested the Indians to let it pass unnoticed. It is hardly necessary to add that, with his faithful bodyguard, who had come to watch over him from feelings of earnest respect, gratitude, and affectionate regard, the agent accomplished the remainder of his journey in perfect safety. Several years had elapsed, as the reader can easily estimate, since Kit Carson met while traveling home with one of his expeditions. The Mormon delegate to Congress, who had informed him of his appointment as Indian agent, during this length of time, Kit Carson has retained the office and rendered satisfactory service. The tract of country over which the Indians roam, who are especially connected with this agency, is about equal to its area, to any one of the larger states in the American Confederacy. The Indians who are under his jurisdiction are large and powerful bands of Apaches and Utahs. But, as we have said before, neighboring tribes freely seek his counsel, aid and protectorate power as they may require it, and they all, from habit, consider that they have a claim on his services. To best illustrate this, we have but to cite one instance of which a thousand similar exist. Two Indian women were taken prisoners by the red men of the plains from a band of savages not under the immediate control of Kit Carson who inhabited a section of New Mexico. These squaws, while captives, were subjected to the severest labor and the most brutal punishment which Indian ingenuity could invent. For one year they submitted without exhibiting any outward symptoms by which their condition could be known, but at the end of that time they resolved to escape, even if they were killed in the attempt. Watching a favorable opportunity, they started, and fortunately, so well laid their plans that, for some time, they were not missed. On their prolonged absence being noticed, a party who were well mounted commenced the pursuit, no doubt believing that to recapture the runaways would be an easy task. The squaws, however, eluded the horsemen, and, on foot, made their way to Kit Carson's house at Taos. By him they were hospitably received, entertained, and amply provided for. They had traveled on foot for hundreds of miles, and, while en route, had lived on roots and such other food as fell in their way. In their reduced condition it required kindness, proper diet, and rest to resuscitate them. In the comfortable house to which they had come, these things were at hand, and were freely given, without hoping for the rewards which man can give. The pursuers of these unfortunate Indian women followed on their trail, which, with native instinct, the squaws had made as indistinct as possible, until they found themselves at a Mexican settlement within the boundaries of New Mexico. Here they were informed that their late captives were safe under the protection of Kit Carson. This name acted like magic in settling their future mode of proceedings. They needed nothing more to bid them face about and retrace their steps to their own homes. 
the squaws in the household of Kit Carson rapidly recruited, and when the time came for them to be sent to their own tribe, they went away rejoicing at their good fortune, first in making their escape, and second because they had been so humanely treated by a man whose name they had often heard, but never before seen. As we have said before, and with truth, this is but one example of thousands which have passed by unheralded since Kit Carson first commenced his official career as Indian agent. The duties of an agent are not by Kit Carson confined to the mere letter of the law. His is a heart that could not be happy were he not daily doing some equitable and humane act to ameliorate the condition of the Indian race. The strict duties of an Indian agent require that he should receive and disburse certain sums of money in purchasing such minor articles as the tribes over which he is placed may require. He is to give monthly and quarterly reports to the general government and the superintendent of the territory he is in on the condition, crimes, practices, habits, intentions, health, and such other things as pertain to the economy of his charge. How seldom is the knowledge property attained, and how often are these things entrusted to clerks while the principal receives the emoluments of his office? Of the details which make the Indian happy or miserable, he too frequently knows but little about except from routine. The agent, if he be a fit man, and the Indian is by no means slow in forming his estimate of the person he has to deal with is received into the confidence of the tribes when, after sufficient trial, he has been proved worthy of their esteem and friendship. When once he has gained a foothold in the affections of the savages, his task assumes the condition of pleasure rather than severe labor. But, if he is ignorant of the minute workings of his business, he is generally imposed upon and always disliked to such a degree that no honorable man would retain such a position longer than to find out his unpopularity and the causes of it. The Indian agent, to perform his duties well, must be continually at his agency house, or among the Indians, in order that he may personally attend to their wants and protect them from the mercenary visits and contact of outside intruders who are continually watching their opportunity, like hungry wolves, to prey upon and cheat them in every shape and form. In fine, he is to assist the superintendent in managing the entire Indian family. The business of Indian agent, which he strictly and conscientiously attends to, keeps Kit Carson employed during the most of his time. Yet, as often as once each year he manages affairs so that he can spend a few weeks in the exciting scenes of the chase. On these excursions, which are eagerly looked forward to by his friends, he is accompanied by the crack shots of the country, including his Indian and Mexican friends. On horseback and on open prairies, Kit Carson is indisputably the greatest hunter in America, if indeed he is not the greatest hunter now living. He has killed, in the brief space of three consecutive hours, with his rifle, twenty-two antelope, at a time when the game was so scarce that other men who followed the business of hunting under pay, and were no ordinary shots, thought themselves doing well to bring down six of the same animals. It gives the greatest satisfaction to the people of New Mexico that Kit Carson is, from time to time, reinstalled in his office of Indian agent, notwithstanding the other great changes that have been and are continually making in their politics. His fitness for the position which he holds cannot be doubted. When the good already accomplished by his efforts is considered, no one would be so loath to part with his services as the Indians themselves. His influence reaches far beyond his own tribes, and is felt by the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Kiowas, who are fast becoming very chary about visiting with hostile intentions the settlements of northern New Mexico. Kit Carson is still in the full vigor of his manhood, and is capable of undergoing almost any amount of privation and hardship. Therefore we infer that, to the country he has adopted, he will be spared many years to come, as one of its most valuable citizens. And when the time arrives for his final exit from this stage of life, 
he will bequeath to his family and friends a spotless character and an enviable reputation. End of Section 32 Chapter 17 Part 4 Recording by Marty on the Central Coast of California End of The Life and Adventures of Kit Carson by DeWitt C. Peters